The moment you actually put yourself first, though, you're considered selfish. Michelle Ellman, the queen of boundaries and accredited life coach, inspires mental health awareness around the world. If there was one thing that actually changed my own life and my client's life, it's boundaries. And that's where it all starts. And I truly believe that is the thing that most women specifically need. Why women and not men? Because women are trained to be people pleasers. Women are trained to put everyone else before themselves. And even if it's not done in an overt way, it's done in a way that the greatest compliment you can give a woman is to be selfless. I want to link back to what you said around self-love and boundaries. Are they linked? Yes, because you need to have self-esteem to believe you deserve to set boundaries. But also, when if we come back to the fact that boundaries are about treatment, people with lower self-esteem don't believe they deserve good treatment. So what's the difference between being selfish and having a boundary? Hey everyone, and welcome back to another episode of A Millennial Mind. Today we have the queen of boundaries that is going to tell you how you can set any boundary in your life in all your relationships. So if you're struggling to set any boundaries in your relationships with your family, your friends or at work, this episode is really going to help you. As always, I'd be so grateful if you could press the like, follow and subscribe button wherever you're watching this because it helps me more than you know. I hope you're all having a wonderful start to the new year. Let's get into the episode. Michelle. Hi. Welcome to Millennial Mind. Thanks for having me on. The Queen of Boundaries is here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I want to know where you got that title from. So tell me, how did the Queen of Boundaries come about? Tell us who you are. You know, the last few times people keep saying it's self-appointed. I did not self-appoint myself, the Queen of Boundaries. My followers started calling me the self, the Queen of Boundaries and I just took it and it's now on my books. But it's because I was talking about boundaries so much and because it was almost like the opposite to what I used to be. So I used to be a people pleaser. I used to be a pushover. And when I was looking for the second subject that I wanted to write for my second book, I was like, what was the one thing that really changed my life? And it was because I had gone through two years worth of rejections and I almost quit and it was because my agent at the time had said to me if you could only write one book what it, would it want to be about and I knew I wanted it on personal development I'm a life coach it's all I've ever cared about and then I was like if there was one thing that actually changed my own life and my client's life it's boundaries and that's where it all starts and I truly believe that is the thing that most women specifically need. Why women and not men? Because women are trained to be people pleasers. Women are trained to put everyone else before themselves. And even if it's not done in an overt way, it's done in a way that the greatest compliment you can give a woman is to be selfless. And so we learn that actually in order to be a good wife, to be a good mother, to be a good human, you have to put everyone else first. And it's because in the beginning of my career, I was very much known for self-love and body positivity. But I found it really frustrating that everyone wants to talk about self-love, self-care. The moment you actually put yourself first, though, you're considered selfish. And I was like, OK, so if you put everyone else first, there is no time and energy left for self-love and self-care. Mm -hmm. And it's not an optional thing, because if you decided you need to rest, you're near burnout, you're exhausted and you want to actually be able to look after yourself for an evening and maybe just sit on your sofa and watch Grey's Anatomy and chill out. You have to ignore your boss's need for a reply to that email. You have to ignore your boyfriend who might want you to join him at a house party. You actually need to ignore other people's needs in order to take care of your, yourself. And when you look at the definition of the word selfish, it, does, it says at the disregard of other people's needs. And that's the issue people have with that word. But it's literal because you, it's not optional that you have to ignore other people's needs if you want to put your own first. So what's the difference between being selfish and having a boundary? The first hurdle that women fall at is the fact that they don't believe they deserve to set boundaries. They don't believe they deserve good treatment. So what boundaries are is it teaches the world how to treat you. It's the line between what is and isn't acceptable and it's all about treatment. But if you have no self-esteem, you will let anyone treat you however they want to treat you and you don't believe that you deserve better than that. Mm -hmm. And I think what you're saying here is, it's, and you said this at the start, it's quite unconscious as well. So there'll be someone listening to this right now saying, I'm really strong and, you know, well, I always actually end up in a situation where I don't know how to set my boundaries. So what's the root of it all? And why have you said many times at this podcast already <laughs> that women are trained, women are taught, women are, you know, it's very normal for them 
to not have any boundaries. Why do you think that happens with women especially? Well, I think part of it is the fact that women are trained to be indirect communicators. So we aren't allowed to be direct in the same way men are, because if men are direct, they get told they're confident, self-assured. He just knows what he wants. He's a great leader. He's so clear and concise. If a woman does the same thing, she's harsh, aggressive, difficult. She is selfish. A bit or, much. A bit much. Or, oh, I mean, there are a lot worse words that we haven't named here and I probably can't use. <laughs> but we know the words that are named, that women are named because they are acting in the same way men do, but it's not normalised. And so as a result, women learn to be indirect communicators, which leads to passive aggression or sarcasm or those jokes that aren't really jokes or bitching, which is something women get a lot of shit for, but no one actually bothers to look underneath and go, well, why do women bitch more than men? Because they aren't allowed to be direct communicators. So we learn that behavior. Oh my God, preach, honestly. So this is something I struggle with, by the way, because I'm a very direct person and I find it really difficult when people are passive aggressive to me, men and women. And I do think more men are becoming quite passive aggressive. And I often find myself being in situations where I'm saying, can you just be straight with me? Because I don't know where I stand here. And it mm. makes me feel very uncomfortable. But from a young age, I was always taught to, well, I always did speak my mind and I was labeled all those things. I still am half the time difficult, stubborn, a bit much, you know, um, she'll put you in your place. All of these things that some people will view me in a really positive way. And I've had to reframe myself mm. as well. I'm strong. I say what I want. I know what I'm going to get. I'm ambitious. You know where you stand with me. Exactly. But there will still be people who will sit, speak to me, I'm sure, behind my back mm. and say negative things about those things. Now, I'm very comfortable with people saying that because I'm very happy at the person who can just tell you how they feel. Yeah. And I talk a lot around confrontation. And I think confrontation is the best thing you can learn how to do because if you confront a situation, it means you want to solve it. Mm. The issue I have is a lot of the time, as you said, women don't necessarily feel that they can say what they want. Therefore, they'll bitch about it and the situation gets worse. Mm. They don't solve it. Whilst men, they'll be like, hey, that annoyed me. Let's sort it out. Yeah. Right? And this is a massive, massive stereotype. I'm not saying all women are like this and all men are like this. But it is seen to be uncomfortable if a woman says, hey, listen, I was really annoyed about what you did the other day. I want yeah. to talk about it. If a man says it, it's like, yeah, whatever. Well, at least he's addressing it. And, you know, he's so attractive because he knows what he wants. He's so ambitious. And, you know, he's just so firm. Mm. A woman being firm. Yeah. My God. But the one thing with boundaries, though, is what I realise is it being that person who says, hey, is something up because you've been acting a bit distant, whether that's in my dating life or with friends, is that they actually have permission now right. to have boundaries with me. And so one of the best things when people ask what's life with boundaries like, I'm always like, it's simple because I don't sit there wondering how many hours I wasted in my life wondering if my friends were annoyed at me when actually now, if I think that, I will just go to them and say, hey, are you annoyed at me? You've been acting off. Or or I will say to them, hey, that thing you said to me two weeks ago, because sometimes you don't feel it in the moment. Sometimes you're not angry in the moment. And then you go to bed and you've just got this whole conversation running in your head and all the things you wish you'd said. I can actually go. I now know that there's no time limit on boundaries. And you can actually say, hey, you know that thing that you said to me two weeks ago? It's been really sitting with me and I didn't like how it made me feel. Mm. Can you not do X and Y again? And I love that because boundaries are applicable to everyone. And I talk about this with confrontation. And what I say is there is, you're only going to confront a situation or set a boundary with somebody that you care about. Mm. But if I don't care about you and if I don't, you, look, I can't confront every single person that comes into my life. Okay, yeah. If a random person on Instagram or TikTok says that they hate me, I'm not going to go up to them and say, oh my God, I hate you back. I'm just, or I'm going to be upset about it. But I do have a boundary in place. Where I'm like, that's not going to affect me. Yeah. Right. Nor am I going to confront the situation because I don't care about user 312. So I do think that's a myth around boundaries that when someone ha sets a boundary with you, they're angry with you. Yes. A lot of the times they're not angry with you. What they're trying to do is better the relationship so because as you said, if they didn't set boundaries with you and they just cut you off, that's because they can't be bothered exactly. to actually go through the process of telling you what they want and what they need. And so setting a boundary is trying to better the relationship. The reason why people think it's because you're angry at them is because they were never set boundaries as a child. 
Or when boundaries were set with them, they were so extreme that they were full of anger. So they only know rule setting, boundaries or setting limits in any kind as equating to anger because that's what their childhood was like. Wow, that's so interesting. Okay, so give me an example of a boundary that doesn't equate to anger. So saying something like, um, I love this example in dating because I always believe you should start all dating relationships with a precedent for boundaries. So if a guy books a date that is two hours away from where you live and two minutes away from where he lives, just saying something like, this doesn't work for me. Let's pick somewhere in the middle. That's a boundary. I'm not angry. Just I do not blame you for trying to choose the option that is most convenient for you. But I also am not going to choose the option that is least convenient for me. Let's do it fairly. Let's start a precedent for us both making equal effort for this relationship. Otherwise, I don't want it. Mm, Wow, that's so interesting. I never even thought of it like that because I think... You're right. When we think of boundaries, it has to be something really aggressive and something yeah. rude and something has to be wrong. Yeah. But there's obviously positive ways of setting boundaries. And you've just said a really interesting point. You said at the start of a relationship, you want to set those boundaries. OK, yeah. now there's going to be a lot of people listening to this that are going to be thinking, OK, well, it's too look, early. It's too early or it's too late. What do I do? Yes. Let's so, start with the early minute, early bit. So too early. There is no too early. It's so much harder to change a dynamic rather than establish a dynamic that has boundaries in place. So it's not just where they book the date. It's also them texting you at two o'clock in the morning. No matter what kind of relationship you have. I don't care if it's a casual relationship. I don't care if you're just fuck buddies. You deserve to have respect. You text someone at a decent time with enough notice. And if they do not, if you reply to a text at two o'clock in the morning, do not expect better behavior. Someone will always design their dating life to be most convenient for them. Humans are lazy. They want the easiest route. If you let them take the easiest route, both men and men and women and everyone in between, they will take the easiest route. That is not their fault. It is your fault for accepting it. And so you have to determine what your standard is. And when you tell your standard to the person, so hey, so you reply at nine o'clock in the morning instead and you go, hey, I'm just heading to work. For the record, I don't reply to texts past a certain hour. And if you want to make a plan with me, I'm going to need more notice. Okay, but Michelle, this this is this is going to be uncomfortable for someone to say, okay? Be uncomfortable. Be scared. Send the text and hide your phone for four <laughs> hours if you want. Put it on airplane mode because you're so scared of the reply. Do the behavior. I don't care how, what, how you feel about it. If you're going to do something different, if you want to keep dating the same standard of guys you've always been dating, go ahead and keep doing the same thing. If you want to be texted at two in the morning, I'm not going to stop you. I'm not the one arguing to up level your dating life. But if you want to up level, like, I just don't care. It doesn't affect me. Whereas if you want to up level your dating life, here's the option. Use it. Don't use it. It's not doesn't affect me. Doesn't that feel really formal? Did, did you see where I'm coming from? Hey, just to let you know, I'm going to work all day and I'm not going to be on my phone. It seems a bit formal to me. Well, what what do you want to put around it? I was just wondering if it's okay whether I can not text you for the whole day. But please <laughs> let me know if that's inconvenient to you because instead, if well, rather than doing my work all day, I'll be on the phone texting you. Listen, I'm a very much person that's like you can always make the time. So no offence, everyone poos every day. Yes, and you should text and, while you poo or go and, get your lunch. And you're not entitled to my time having just met me as a complete stranger. You do not get a fast enough, you don't get the same speed of reply as my best friend does. You do not get the same speed of reply as my mum does, as my dad does, who has been there and proven over time that they deserve my trust, they deserve my time and they deserve my energy. You are a stranger in my life. We've maybe been on one date. We've not been on any dates at all. We're still texting on a dating app. You will get a reply when it's convenient for me. I am an automatic replier to anyone so I'm like a nightmare in your situation I'm like straight away me too and with dating I am consciously slowing down those replies because faster replies leads to faster attachment and then you're attaching to the idea of relationship because texting is not in-person interaction rather than the person themselves and if you're having the whole conversation over text what is the motivation to meet in person Mm, how interesting. So, for example, my boyfriend, when the first time he texted me at 10 o'clock in the morning, I said, I didn't reply until six o'clock. And I replied at six o'clock saying, hey, I was at work all day. Just for the record, I don't text during working hours. I find it too distracting. It's not the fact I haven't seen it. I didn't pretend that it's the fact I haven't seen it. I had seen it. I acknowledged that by saying, 
it's distracting. I'm a writer. I spend my time writing. If I'm replying to texts, I'm not writing. I get that. And I'm also in a flow when I'm mm. writing my books especially. And I can't be replying to texts. Otherwise, it disrupts my flow. Mm. And then I was like, just I'll reply to you when I'm done with work for the day. You feel free to text me during the day, but I'll just get back to you when I'm done. Or in my lunch hour or something like that. Slowly over time, I started replying to him in working hours. And one day he said to me, oh, I thought you don't text during working hours. And I was like, I didn't text the person who I'd been on one date with during working hours. The guy I've been seeing for five months, I do text him during working hours the same way I reply to my friends during working hours. But if I'm writing my books, I still don't reply to texts. I love that. And I guess it's more around the boundaries you set with yourself. I don't believe boundaries with yourself is a term and that's a controversial take. But because okay. boundaries is something you set with other people, there seems to be this misunderstanding around you can set boundaries with yourself as a coded way to say it's self-discipline. When okay. actually it's not it's not about your relationship with yourself. It's more with your relationship with other people because it's all about treatment. And yes, how you treat yourself is important. But I think some of the ways that boundaries is being misused as a term is in a very, you know how sometimes we misuse the word discipline, yeah, especially around workouts, mm. diet, mm. as a way of being unkind to ourselves. I think boundaries has now been thrown into that camp. How interesting. I definitely say that, by the way. I definitely <laughs> well, believe that. I disagree. Feel free to use it if you want. So, uh, yeah, I want to I want to under- unpack that a little bit. So. If I know that my goal is to run a marathon at the end of the year, me and I love I love that I want to do that. Why is that not self-discipline, self-love, setting a boundary with myself? But it's not setting a boundary with yourself. It's not setting a boundary with myself saying that, okay, every Sunday I'm not going to go out with my friends because I have to be in bed by nine o'clock because I have to run every single Monday That's morning. That's just discipline. That that's okay. that's not boundaries. Boundaries are how we teach other people other people how to treat us. It's about treatment. So it's from an external okay. source. It's about Fine. what you deserve. It's about getting your needs met. It's about getting your wants met from other people. Okay. And when it's waking up at certain time to train for a marathon, that's just discipline. That's that's a different aspect. And the reason why I think it's really important to separate it is because especially when it comes to certain platforms online we use these terms for everything when Mm. there are just there are certain terms for certain things and boundaries are about how we treat other people other people and how other people treat us that's really interesting so it wouldn't be to say like my boundary is that every Sunday I can't come so the easiest way to explain it is boundaries is like a house so it's not a brick wall so you can still open the door you can still let people in you can also kick people out of your house but you can't have a boundary with yourself because you can't be both within the house and outside the house. Okay, that's really interesting. That's really good, actually. I, I agree with you in that term. What I meant was I always say self-love is, self, is discipline. Like, discipline is self-love. Absolutely, but in nowhere in that is the word boundary. Boundary, yeah. I, that makes sense, actually, because it's about other people and not about you. Okay, so the second part of that question was, if you're in a relationship and you struggle to set boundaries mm. with your partner... What do you do? Because let's say you've been in a relationship for 10 years. Mm. You're married to this person. And you are somebody who hasn't, as a woman, hasn't communicated how you felt, hasn't um, really expressed any boundaries, Mm. and often find that when you do bring anything up, it turns into an argument. Yeah. What do you do at that point? Because now you've been in a relationship with someone who knows that these are your habits, Mm. who knows that they have that control, who knows that they will necessarily never be called out for anything. And now they're going to say, well, I listened to this podcast with Shivani Michelle Mm. and she told me that I've set a boundary with you. What the hell do they do? Well, I think, first of all, you want to educate yourself on boundaries. I see a lot of people setting boundaries that aren't boundaries when actually they're just walls, like saying F you to someone, like ghosting. That's not a boundary. Like, Or something that someone said to me the other day is... My boundary is you can't be mean to me. How the hell do you set a boundary what? around what is... I don't know what's mean to you and what's not mean to you. That's not setting a boundary. What you can say is if you raise your voice, specific behaviour, that is disrespectful and I will not stay in the room if you speak to me like that. Or you can say, if you swear at me, be specific. Be mean is vague, but also be mean is subjective. Mean to you is not mean to me. So like you can't set a boundary around don't be mean to me. That's my boundary. It's not a boundary. It so it doesn't funny. make sense. Okay. And so I think you have to make it very clear what your boundary is around. 
And then so a lot of the times it's actually really helpful, especially if it's a long term relationship and you're married and you've been together for 10 years to actually sit the person down and bring them into the conversation. Because the likelihood is if you have no boundaries, your partner probably doesn't have great boundaries either. And so say, hey, I was listening to this podcast. I was learning about boundaries and I really want to start giving it a try. I think a few things are going to be different around here. It might be a bit shocking to you. There might be uncomfortable moments. And I'd love you to go on this journey with me. And it might be a bit uncomfortable for a period but let's learn this together if you want to know more information about boundaries you can buy the joy of being selfish by Michelle Elwood (laughs) like something like that give them a book give them the knowledge tell them to listen to the podcast as well and be like let's learn it together and actually do it as a couple to better our relationship but that's really uncomfortable for somebody who perhaps has gone away with Mm. being in a relationship with somebody who has no boundaries they love it Yes, and there's probably a reason why you want to set boundaries. There's probably something that isn't working in your relationship. And as much as people always want to focus on how uncomfortable setting boundaries is, but no one wants to focus on how uncomfortable living without boundaries is. I remember how uncomfortable it was. I remember how many times I used to be anxious about someone hating me or worried because I've gone to bed and someone's been really mean to me all day and I don't know how to speak up for myself. They're just different versions of difficult. So which difficult do you want? And the boss positive of setting boundaries as much as it's difficult is the more you do it the easier it gets a hundred percent and I actually think the times where I felt worse about myself is when I haven't stood up for myself Mm. that is actually for me when I really struggle with waking up the next day thinking why didn't I say something because by me not saying something that person is going to do it over and over and over Mm. again and I've just let them do it and also I think I'm quite confident as a person and so It makes me even more angry at myself to think if I can't do it, then how am I expecting everyone else to do it? And you say you were really angry at, but it's because... Me? I'm angry at me. Yes, but that's because boundaries is, uh, the two emotions around it are anger and resentment. So when you don't set a boundary and a boundary is broken, you can either express that anger and resentment or you can bury it internally and that's why you feel that way towards yourself. When I say express anger and resentment, there's also a lot of confusion around this because I don't mean yell and scream at the person you're angry at. But what I mean is we have to separate angry behavior versus anger itself. Anger is a healthy emotion. How you might be expressing it might not be. So if you're raising your voice, you're swearing, all of these things, it's not a healthy way to express it. The emotion itself is still healthy and a good thing that you need to be listening to so when you feel anger in your body you can recognize oh a boundary was crossed I need to set a boundary but that does not mean you get to pearl that anger at another person you need to go and process your emotions and when you're ready actually go set that boundary that is so interesting because I think a lot of the time we look at anger as a really bad emotion just how we look at jealousy as a Mm. really bad emotion I don't think jealousy is a bad thing I don't think it is at all because it's just showing you what you want. If you have envy and you're saying, I hate that person because they have this, that's different. But you can be jealous and say, I'm really jealous that that person has a really beautiful podcast studio. So I think all emotions are information. They provide you information about what you want in life, all of these things. Anger is the only negative emotion, negative because that's how society sees it, but negative emotion that gives you energy. Have you ever been completely exhausted and then someone's pissed you off and you've suddenly got all the energy in the world? And like, for me, I don't tend to, I well, it's healthier to not do it at people. And a lot of the times you can't change the situations you're angry about. But I, in that moment, because I'm aware that it creates energy, we'll go write a podcast episode. I'll go do, write some of my book. I'll channel it into something creative because it gives you so much energy and we don't utilize that anger enough. So many of my books are written by pure anger. I will see something stupid that makes no sense online and I will just go and write in my book the exact opposite of what that person said. Um, and I will use that for my creativity. When it comes to jealousy, what what the information is providing you there is it's spotlighting what you want more of in life. And if you change the word jealousy from inspiration, it's actually very similar feelings within your body and for example if you've seen someone win a podcast episode uh, one win a podcast award you can sit in that jealousy or you can go oh I clearly want a podcast award I should actually go and uh, do whatever I need to upscale my podcast in order to reach that level 
The difference, I think, between jealousy and inspiration is one you feel completely out of control mm. and one you feel in control. When you're inspired by something, you feel happy because you think you can do it. Yeah. When you feel jealous, you feel they've got that for a reason that I possibly couldn't. And therefore, I'm going to be jealous about it and actually find myself being in a position where I can't achieve that. Well, and also, so, I think with jealous, it's this idea that something's been taken away from exactly. you, but you're not actually entitled to that thing to begin with. So. Exactly. And also, I think it's about thinking, what can I do with it? my control if I like something that mm. someone else has got why can't I achieve it but I also think some of the elements of we're talking about jealousy within work but some of the elements within jealousy in a relationship we actually create that narrative in our head and make ourselves jealous so if we see our partner talking to someone and maybe they're like they've got their arms on each other or something they've like they're touching each other you can really easily create a narrative around it and then you walk 100%. up to it and it turns out it's their cousin or something like that and you don't realise or it's their best friend from school or whatever it is but you've created this whole narrative based off something you've seen from afar and you've deduced a whole narrative around it and you're feeling an emotion because before an emotion you get a thought and that thought creates the emotion so if you have a thought that guy is flirting with that woman doesn't matter who the woman is it just means that you feel that jealousy because you've created a narrative around it so how do we stop that thought from becoming an emotion i guess fact check it so you don't know anything about the situation other than they clearly know each other well because they're hugging or whatever it is they clearly know each other well why don't i go over and ask a few more questions rather than jumping to an assumption now this is where a lot of people will say well that's being passive aggressive I, let's say you went over and you were a bit like, oh, well, how do you two know each other? It's going to be obvious that you're annoyed. Yes, if you say it in that way. But also, ha the only how reason do you two know each other? <laughs> the only reason you think it's passive aggression is because you're trying to be subtle about it. Why not just be direct about it? Say, oh, I just saw you guys from across the room and this is my boyfriend. How, how do you know each other? How interesting. I that, that's not passive aggressive. It's quite territorial, though. If I was... See okay, let's just... Put it but only because you have the jealous mindset. Because, sorry, if I saw someone hug my boyfriend, I would also want to know who that person is because you're in his life, I'm in his life, I would like to know who you are. How is that... I I'm just not a jealous person. I'm, honestly, like, all my boyfriends have flirted in front of me. I just don't care. <laughs> honestly, I had a friend come up to me and said... You do know your boyfriend's flirting. This was like when I was 21. Your boyfriend's flirting over there. And I went, well, he's coming home with me. If I can't compete with a random girl in a club, good luck to, good luck to him. Because That's like, funny. if he doesn't know what he has at home, then it's, a, it's the end of the relationship yeah, anyway. Yeah, okay. Why should I have to convince? I, should, I definitely shouldn't be competing, no matter how long the relationship is, whether it's been six months. I shouldn't have to compete with a random girl in a club. If I have to, then this relationship is over anyway. But I would find it weird if I was talking to my friend and then his girlfriend came over and said, I've just seen you two across the room hugging. <laughs> How do you know each other? I'd be but like, you're worried about it anyway. So why are you stood across the room and worrying about it anyway? No, no. If I'm the person talking, if I'm the hugger. Oh. Yeah, I would find that weird if someone came over like that. But this is an imaginary situation <laughs> where this woman is standing there jealous anyway. Yes, true. Maybe the the solution isn't to walk up in that exact moment, but yeah. to talk to your boyfriend when they come over. Yes, agree. And say, hey, I was feeling a little bit jealous. Uncomfortable, yeah. Yeah, but actually communicating how you felt about the situation. Absolutely, there are different yeah. ways of approaching it. I can't relate because I'm just not a jealous person. But what I'm saying is what the solution is, isn't to then be angry at him for a reason he doesn't doesn't know what why you're angry at him and then it comes out it's that whole thing of like what's wrong nothing 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 and it's because you've been seething about this thing that's happened when actually you've created this whole narrative around it you have no context around it you made a bunch of assumptions to to annoy yourself and actually the reality is you've made a bunch of assumptions based on your own insecurity true and so that narrative didn't come into your brain because it was just magic in your brain it was came into your brain because you don't have enough certainty in your relationship and actually maybe that's something you can have a conversation on so saying something like hey I noticed um that I'm starting to feel a bit more jealous in our relationship and I actually think it's because we've not been spending a lot of time together I actually think we should be seeing each other more so that I just feel a little bit more secure or here are some ways you can reassure me within the relationship I would really appreciate it if you could just reassure me more I'm clearly going through a period where I'm just feeling a bit uncertain and maybe this is because I'm feeling uncertain in my career right now and it's transferring over or whatever it is but I just really appreciate more texts once in a while or seeing each other a bit more and if they're not up for that cool there's the door bye
Yeah. <laughs> I wish I was that girl that could just say nothing. When my boyfriend's like, what's wrong? I'm like, well, this is what's wrong because... I the, you the, don't the, want to be the person who says nothing. Yeah, I know. That's I'm just joking. Aggressive. Yeah, but I wish I could just shut up sometimes. Sometimes I'm like, just be quiet and don't say anything. But I'm like, this upset me, and he's like, okay. But you know, I do. I do think the one thing that has completely changed my relationship is the ability to say I'm feeling really insecure about this. Mm. So there was a, a period in my life where I was feeling really insecure about a particular thing, and I just said, listen, I'm really insecure about this at the moment. This means that I need a lot of a lot more reassurance around this. And I communicated exactly how I felt. And he was then in turn able to comfort me. Mm. The problem is, is I think that we've romanticized this idea that your partner should just know you. Yeah. And your partner should be able to remember every single thing you've said and be able to have an action plan waiting for them to do after yeah. it. So if you're upset about something and it's okay to feel insecure and jealous, yeah. you can say, I'm really insecure that you're going, you're, you're spending loads of time with your work friends every single week. And it, it makes me feel really uncomfortable yeah. because you don't message me for six hours. What's better than saying insecure is actually using the emotion. So it's, I'm feeling quite hurt or I'm feeling quite sad about. Interesting. Because that gives someone a better roadmap. But also in general, boundaries are about giving people a roadmap on how to help you. And what people go, there's a sentence that everyone says, which is like, oh, well, if they they loved me, they would know. And yes. I was like, what? Because they can read your mind. Also, are you a predictable human? Because one time you cry, you might want to hug. One cry, you might be leave me the fuck alone. Yeah. You're not a predictable human. It depends on the context. And for different situations, you might want a different response. They do not know that. And even if they've known you for years, because you are not predictable, because humans change, because people want different things from different situations, you still need to tell them. And it's not the fact. And then the sentence that follows is... Well, if I tell them, then it won't mean as much. If I tell them I want a birthday present, then it won't mean as much. Oh, God. Wait, so you've told someone what you want. They've given you exactly what you wanted because they know how much it means to you and it doesn't mean as much. You know, for my birthday, um, I actually told my boyfriend that words mean a lot for me and I don't just want a card. I want a double-sided card with yep. it fully written. I was that specific because I'm very I knew specific if too. I got a birthday card that said happy birthday, Day, I would have thrown it across the room. Oh, so 100%. I was very specific about it. And they were like, oh, you shouldn't have to ask that. Your your boyfriend should be able to write a card. I'm an author. Words mean a lot to me. My boyfriend is not an author. My boyfriend doesn't say a lot with his words. And he is the kind of person who usually says less than more. Mm. And I, I, it was actually our first Valentine's Day. I didn't get a card. So we, we got together officially in November. Christmas, I didn't get a card. But I was like, Christmas, sometimes you don't have a card. Then... Valentine's Day I didn't get a card and then I said for my birthday I want a card by the way I also expect a card four times a year and this is actually a thing he now does where I was like I want a card for Christmas I want a card for Valentine's Day I want a card for my birthday and I also want a card for our anniversary and I was like and I expect a double-sided card every single time I love what's funny is our anniversary is a week away from my birthday so an anniversary card some of it is always like I've run out of things, things to, to say. say. <laughs> I love that. That's that is literally the same as me. So I like a card because I think that's the way you can express yourself mm. without feeling a bit uncomfortable and awkward. And yesterday was actually my anniversary with my boyfriend. And when he wrote the card, I started crying. And I always cry when mm. he writes the card because they're really thoughtful. But the first time for our anniversary, he didn't get me a card. And I said, Where's my card? And he wrote it on like the tag of like a gift. Yeah. And I was like, no, I want a card. And so now I think that he knows and he can see that I'm emotional every time and that words do mean a lot to me. Mm. He makes the effort to do it. So I don't have to tell him to write the double sided. But I think it's because I asked him to write a thoughtful yeah. message the first time that he's now continued to do it. And I think that it's important to say that. Yeah. You know, for me, it's really important that you write me a card and you, and you make that effort. I remember in one of the first cards, he was like, girlfriends have asked me to do this kind of thing before and I've never done it but I guess this relationship means a lot more to me no. that like and it is that thing of he had to learn how to write cards he had to learn how to use his words more I had to learn gifts I'm not very good with gifts I have I am stressed about my boyfriend's birthday that is in March I'll I have you. been stressed I'm a very good gift giver for the last year because I've been thinking about this 
the amount of time and energy I put into his gifts now because I know it means so much to him, but it's just not natural to me. Yeah. Is there a part of me that absolutely could go, oh, well, I'm just not good at gifts, so why should I try? It's not natural to me, which is a response that a lot of partners get. And absolutely I could, but I know he's made the effort to change to write cards for me. So I'm going to make the effort to think ahead and do all the things that I need in order to be good at gifts. Some of the things are like, for example, I leave them too late. I only remember, I'm very good at buying gifts when I think of someone, but that means I might think of them in March and then their birthday's in December. And then I'm like, well, I've run out of stuff, things because I've given you something in March. So now I just plan a little bit more. But all of that extra thought, I don't care that my boyfriend had to say it. I care that every single moment when I didn't choose to do the easy option and did the harder option, that's the effort that matters. That it's not about whether he can read my mind or I can read his mind. It's about the fact that whether I'm listening when you tell me something and whether I change my behaviour. And what do you think people should do if they don't change their behaviour? Because I think the reason why a lot of people want to learn how to set boundaries is nobody wants to settle. Nobody wants to be in a relationship where they feel like they're being walked all over. So first of all, how do we recognise that we are? And secondly, how do we change that? So I think when it comes to our dating lives and especially the conversations on social media, it's very extreme. So it's either like ghost them or disappear or whatever it is or end the relationship, red flag run, like not healthy either that's actually a lot of people who are giving advice who are like disguising their avoidance because what happens when you ghost or just run the moment you see a red flag is actually you're not engaging in the hard conversation needed to change that behavior and that's a lot harder than just running because you see a red flag if you run every time you see a red flag you there will be no one left and also you will judge yourself harsher because every time you make a mistake you will have the same level of judgment you project on other people anytime they made mistakes that's all a red flag in literal terms is a warning of potential danger potential but everyone forgets that word there's a difference between a red flag and a deal breaker if someone hits you that's not a red flag that's a deal breaker that's it that's over no one touches me no one hits me that's done if someone screams and yells at me that potentially it that's a that's a strong red flag for me because that's one of my boundaries that like I just do not like raised voices but people have raised their voice there are times where things get too intense, out of control, you set the boundary and then you set a consequence for the boundary. Hey, if you continue yelling at me, then I'm going to go to the other room. You can come find me when you're ready to talk to me at a respectable tone. And that you have might have to do a few times. Some people grew up in yelling households and in some households it's normal to yell. If you've had a whole childhood of yelling and you're suddenly in a relationship where your partner's telling you, I don't like yelling, then it's going to take a little bit of time. Giving people the time and the grace to change, mm. it means you give yourself that grace too when you're not going to be perfect either. So if you set a consequence and let's say something repeatedly happens, you have to ask yourself if it matters enough for you. So a red flag, I mean, honestly, the red flags I've heard are just stupid. Like what? I don't know. Someone said an ick the other day was putting a helmet on that like it was the grossest thing or walking back from bowling. Like, you know, the walk they do back from bowling was an ick. And I was like, um, (laughs) and it was just, it's things like that. I wouldn't say that's a red flag, but (laughs) that's so funny. But it's it, this is where the behaviour is becoming more and more extreme. It is. So if someone is late, for example, that might be a red flag that I wouldn't end it over. But if it's yes. a repeated behaviour, I am so sensitive about my time. And if it's a repeated behaviour, it would start looking like disrespect to me. And over time, okay. if that doesn't improve, I would then... I would set a boundary, set a consequence. I would repeat the consequence. I would reinforce the boundary. I would say something like, hey, we've already had a conversation about how timing is really important to me I'm I don't like talking about how busy I am but I am very busy and when I sit around and wait for an hour it's really disrespectful to me it feels like you believe your time is more important than my time and it's not Mm. so when we make a plan it's so important for me that you actually turn up on time if you're going to be late then I need you to communicate on it things happen tubes break down trains break down whatever it is if you're going to be 15 minutes late I'm gonna need to know you're gonna be five minutes late that's fine but anything longer than five minutes I deserve a text if it's gonna be longer than 15 minutes I'm not going to be waiting anymore I will leave after 15 minutes and then if it continues to happen 
person and it's that important to you because there are people in the world who are like people are late I don't care I'm late like yeah it doesn't matter to me that's not their boundary everyone has different boundaries but if it's important to you and that's a reason why you want to end the relationship then absolutely but communicate it tell the person it's over tell them hey I can't deal with this anymore mm. I've given you a few warnings I've told you a number of times now I cannot keep dating someone who is going to keep turning up late mm. and the last time you turned up two hours was my last straw and it's just enough for me I had the situation, not in a dating situation, but in a work context where someone asked me to go and meet them for a meeting. I got there five minutes early because we were meeting at, I don't think, let's say 10 o'clock. By the way, it was a members club, so I wasn't allowed to move anywhere or go anywhere. I waited there for 10 minutes and then I didn't have her number. So I emailed and said, hi, I'm here. And I was so angry that day because I was, I was rushing around and this was an hour meeting and I'd only scheduled an hour for it mm. and she didn't reply to me so I'm sitting there in this lobby by the way I don't have my laptop I only have my phone I'm also very rigid with my time so I've scheduled things to do at this particular time and I ha I didn't schedule anything I know that sounds really rigid but mm. in my head I was going there for this meeting I was coming back I didn't take any stuff with me and then she comes out at 25 past going I'm so sorry I was running late and I was so angry. And I said, very annoyed. I was just about to leave, actually. Hmm. Now, this is the first time me meeting this person. And I was it's really, funny, though, because really you said angry. that as if you're passive aggressive, but that's really clear communication. I would say the same. I think it was quite passive aggressive. No, it's clear communication. Because I was like, I was just about to leave, but I wasn't going to leave. I just wanted her to know that I was really pissed oh, off. Oh, then it's passive aggression. No, no, I you wasn't going left. to leave. If I it know. Was, if it w went past half an hour, you wouldn't have left. If it went past half an hour, I would have left, but I was more angry that this person made me get... Also, I was more angry because I could have walked there, but I took the tube because I wanted to be on time. So then I was more angry thinking, oh, I should have walked here instead of taking the tube because I had the time to do that. And but it's did it affect your work relationship? Yeah, it did. And would it change how whether you work with that person again yeah it did yeah so that's the consequence yeah I was really angry but I couldn't I, in the moment I was like just stay calm just stay calm and I was like don't say anything it's fine I was just like because I said to her I didn't hear from but you, you. I something. emailed you but you did say something. yeah I know I can't, can't bloody help myself aggressive. yeah but yeah. this is all clear communication I just wouldn't say it. I, I had a lovely meeting with her after I was just very clear that the next time you're late I will leave yeah and I do that on dates too if yeah. I wait 20 minutes and that's it. But it just sets you off on the wrong foot, doesn't it? Yeah, and that will affect the work relationship. And that's the consequence of not respecting people's time. But I guess they didn't know that I was super obsessed with my time. No, I've never met if them you before. make an appointment for 10 o'clock, it's 10 o'clock. And also, we I think you're going to be 25, 25 minutes late. You should just email and say, I'm really sorry. I shouldn't have to email you twice. Yeah, so I had the same thing. Uh, it was a meeting and I, I emailed at five past. I emailed it. 20 past and then I got a reply at 25 past saying I didn't realise we had a meeting and I was sat in this like rubbish coffee shop in a train station um, and uh, they made zero effort to rearrange the meeting and so we yeah. never met um, years later they reached out again and I remembered and they didn't but that's just my memory <laughs> like it's very I'm bad when too. it comes to some things but <laughs> some things it's really good but that's the consequence you wasted my time once you didn't apologise for it you made no effort to reschedule look life happens we all deserve an element of grace but I think it's very hard when it's a first time meeting whether it's dating or work relationships because there's no trust built up there yeah. now if you're meeting up with a friend and they are usually reliable they are usually on time and then one time they turn up 40 minutes late would I have got up and left 20 minutes in no because and usually a lot of the times because so much of my work is on my phone I'm not that annoyed sitting there waiting yeah but it's the principle it's the yeah. principle that you've built up trust you're not usually like this this is unlike you and so you now get a bit of my benefit of the doubt mm -hmm. if you've never met before however to not turn up on the first meeting and things happen but then text communicate and that's where it's it has to be a combination of good communication and boundaries because actually you storming off after five minutes without trying to communicate without trying to contact them isn't boundaries it's putting a wall up interesting okay but I did email so I'm not putting a wall up I'm so com you, confronting you the situation did email and Correct. also you they Waited. could have communicated on yes. their side yeah, interesting. Okay, that's actually a really good point. I want to link back to what you said around self-love and boundaries. Mm. Are they linked? 
Yes, because you need to have self-esteem to believe you deserve to set boundaries. But also, when if we come back to the fact that boundaries are about treatment, people with lower self-esteem will, don't believe they deserve good treatment. And how do we change that? You start looking at the things that are... So this is why within all my books, I'm very specific about different kinds of behaviour. For example, not commenting on someone's body, not body shaming someone. If you have low self-esteem and someone says something bad about your body, you will then believe that bad thing about your body. If you have good self-esteem and someone makes a comment about your body, the first thing that goes in my head, it might not come out of my mouth, I call it, how dare you? <laughs> like I call it the how dare you method because the first thing goes in my head is, how dare you? And then what comes out of my mouth is, please stop commenting on my body. Wow. I actually often think that you will only be affected by things that you actually are insecure about. So yeah. if somebody said to me, you have orange hair, I'm gonna not going to be affected by it. I use the exact same right? example, but I use blue, blue hair. hair. Yeah, yeah, I've heard that. <laughs> so the thing is, is that it is showing you something that you need to work on. Mm. And that is a bit harsh a lot of the time because if somebody commented about my body, I don't think I would care that much. The one thing I would disagree is that sometimes it doesn't work in that direction. Sometimes it's you actually saying that please don't comment on my body, that you actually grow the confidence in your body after. And actually people think they need that confidence first to be the kind of person who says please don't comment on my body, but they don't realise becoming a person who says please don't comment on my body leads to a more confident confident person because you've stood up for yourself yes. you've set a boundary you have taught yourself in this moment that is not how I want to be talked to and that grows your self-esteem 100% so it's it's a circular thing and you don't have to be that person you want to be to say those words you just need to say those words and even if you can't get to the point of saying please don't comment on my body then don't contribute to the conversation stand there in silence don't say a word say the uh, my one of my favorite boundaries because someone set this with me the first time I consciously knew someone was setting a boundary with me they said the word ouch I said something like they were trying to help me and I said, I don't need your help. I could do it. But like I said, it was in a heat of a moment. I was like, I don't know. And they just went, ouch. And it was like, it was just the silence afterwards that I went, oh, sorry. <laughs> like, because I didn't realise that what I was doing, I was trying to be so like independent. I didn't realise what I was doing was actually pushing away someone's attempt at trying to help me. And it was this word ouch of like, kids do it. But we lose that word ouch as we get older. But if you someone said something rude about your body, like, oh, haven't you got fat over the over the holidays or whatever it is, um, and you just go, ouch. Yeah, you don't need to say anything yeah. more. That is such a good hack. It's making that person aware that what you said is hurtful. I don't need to say more because I shouldn't have to justify my body. And also, I hope you don't do it again. A lot of the time when I've set a boundary, it's come across as rude. And it's only because I've said that made me feel upset because people aren't used to women stating how they feel. Well, also, because you can set the most polite boundary in the world and people can still perceive you as rude. You can still be set the nicest boundary in the world and people can still perceive you as mean. You are not in control of how people respond to your boundaries. That is not within what's in your area of control. So how someone responds to a boundary is largely, largely a reflection on what their relationship with boundaries are. So if they've had a bad relationship with their own boundaries, for example, when I had bad boundaries and someone tried to set a boundary with me, I thought they'd be angry at me. I thought that was the relationship over. I would get heated in the moment. I'd get really intense. Once I had good boundaries, my response now when people set boundaries with me is good for you. Good for you. Thanks yeah. for letting me know. Oh, I'm so glad you told me. And what's changed? Nothing other than the fact my relationship with my own boundaries has changed. And if you have good boundaries and you're walking through this world where the majority of people have bad boundaries, you will rub up against their own issues with their own boundaries. That is so true. I love it when people tell me I didn't appreciate that or yeah. I didn't like that. I'm like, thanks, because how was I meant to know? Yeah. And that's the thing that I think people struggle with in their relationships as you get to know somebody and your family as well. Yeah. I had a boundary with my mum and I said to her, when I'm working... And now I'm not sure. I'm like, is this a boundary or is it not? But I will tell you. When I was living at home, I used to say to my mum, between nine to six, I don't want you coming into my room and asking me irrelevant questions because I'm working mm. and I find it annoying. Before that time, you can. And after that time, you can. And I used to wake up really early because I would know yeah. that seven o'clock when they're up, she's going to be like, what should I make for dinner? What do you want to do today? Mm. Da, 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 all these irrelevant questions. 
And then after dinner, I don't mind her asking me these questions. But my boundary is, do not disturb me in that time. Now, the other day, I went back home because I don't live at home anymore. Mm. My mum came in and I just looked at her and I said, mum, do you remember what I said about the nine to five rule? And she just went, oh, yeah. And then she walked out. Now, at first, she found it really difficult. Yeah. At first, she was like, you're being really rigid. Because what if I need to call you and ask you? And I said, it's not that important. Yeah. And over time, I think the more you set boundaries and the more that you are sticking to them, I guess, the more other people will understand them from you. I think that's also a really important lesson in that in our society, we use the words important and urgent very loosely. The number of emails I get which say urgent and I'm like, we work in social media. Nothing's yeah. urgent. No one's going to die. It's uh, we work in publishing, the slowest industry in the world and nothing is going to happen. Unless my book, uh, to be honest, I actually think there's no situation, even if my book is coming out today, there is no situation that's that urgent. There is no situation that, that that's important. I remember I went on holiday and I was just at a new management and I said to this new management, because it was a new working relationship, I'm going on holiday for the next week. Please don't contact me. I will get back to everything on Monday. And they went, what if an emergency comes in? And I said, we work in social media and publishing. There are no emergencies. I, if a job comes in and I lose the job because I've not replied in the last week, that's on me. I love that. But you have to be so confident and sure in yourself to state that. And also confident that you have enough work coming in that you mm. could stand to lose a week. And what forced me to learn that lesson was being freelance. You are either too busy or bored. There is no in between. So true. And there are periods of time where you will get so little work, you think your career is over. Yeah. I over time, you realize it's a pattern. You realize it's all just in your head and you learn to do things differently. And when I made a decision was actually deciding what my values in life are and what my priorities are. And I remember Cosmopolitan had asked me to be a judge for an awards, which is a huge honor, a huge mm. compliment. The problem was the date they asked me to do this award ceremony was on my first nephew being born and I was flying to Hong Kong for his birth. And... I was like, what do I do? Because that is like, it was the highest compliment I'd ever had in my career. Yeah. And Cosmopolitan was a magazine I grew up reading. And I was like, you know what? What's more important to me? If I say yes to this Cosmo job, this means it, I've started a precedent for always choosing my work over l milestones I literally cannot get back. And so I said no. And what happened, which I just think was such a beautifully universal timing thing, the date of the the um, awards ceremony happened to change and they said, oh, it's actually been moved a few months forward now. Can you actually do this date? Was free on that date. And I was like, can you imagine? Because the f next thing I would have done is gone and cancelled that flight and then been like, what? I cancelled that flight for no reason. And then you're annoyed with them mm. because you cancelled the flight. But actually, yeah. it's your decision. Yeah. A lot of the time, we'll make decisions based on other people's decisions. And then we blame them for that, that decision yeah. when they don't even know about it. So for example, if I've got a birthday party to go to and I cancel it because Vogue have called me, yeah. when Vogue then changed the date, I'm going to blame Vogue yeah. and say, but I could have gone to my cousin's party or my birthday party, but Vogue didn't know. And if I had canceled that flight and chosen to go to the award ceremony over my nephew's birth, I wouldn't have actually told them. I would have said, yes, absolutely. You can make of it course work. you would like, have. Would love to. Thank you so much for the honour. You're and not going to say that. Them. Yeah. So you're right. They wouldn't have known. But also you have to make decisions within your values because then you're never going to regret it. So even if I had chosen uh, my nephew's birth and then the award ceremony wasn't obviously on the day, I would be a bit sad. Obviously. On the day, I would be like oh, I'm a bit gutted, I can't attend. But the reality is I can't be in two places then once. And there's a thing in life coaching, which is you either accept it, you change it, or you suffer. And I, you have to end up being an accept. Because if I am in Hong Kong, at, like with my brand new newborn nephew, and resentful that I'm not in London at the Cosmo Awards, who wins? No one. I just sat there suffering. It's a lose-lose both ways. So if you make a decision, be okay with that and then lean into that decision. You, There's no point living in these two alternate realities. And I think this comes from social media because unfortunately it means now that if I choose uh, my, being around my nephews, it means I can still live the version where yes. I'm at the Cosmo Awards and I can see everyone's Instagram stories who's attended. I can I see the judge they replaced me with. I can see all those things. Um, and I think that's where we have to remember that we, if you choose something, you have to accept the decision you made.
I remember also once being in a situation when I was at home and all my friends were on holiday and I had chosen to stay at home because I had work commitments. But you're right, I was staring that staring at it on holiday, but I didn't want to go on the holiday. Mm. So why am I pretending that I want to be there? Why am I making myself suffer in that instance when I chose to stay here? Well, it's probably because of some... So it's probably tapping into a wound of not being included or tapping into a wound of like being left out or something mm. like that. So usually it's not about the instance in that moment. It's mm. usually because it's tapping into a feeling that feels familiar to a past reason. So even though you know logically that you chose this situation, if it's reminding you of a past situation which you didn't choose, you will feel all the same feelings. Oh, so it could be something similar enough where you got excluded in a playground, for example. But then you have this feeling of almost feeling old feelings because you never processed it at that age. Maybe you didn't have the tools at that age. Maybe you didn't have the language at that age to say to those people, hey, I felt really rubbish when I was excluded because you yeah. were seven years old and you couldn't say that. Um, that means now as an adult, you might feel leftovers of that. And actually the solution is I do a lot of inner child work and going back into that moment, going back into that moment as the adult, saying what you would have said in the moment. Maybe it's something like, hey, don't leave her out. That's an mm. unkind thing to do. And actually standing up for your inner child is a great way to heal feelings like that and not drag it forward into your future. I love that. But I think now as an adult, I just have so much JOMO. When I see people going out, I'm just like, I'm so happy to be here. I know. Or, and I, do you know what I think it is? That everyone relates to memes that says, please leave at nine o'clock. Please don't contact me. I love it when a plan fails. It's because we're all overly stimulated constantly. There's always a plan. There's always something. We just need to rest. And they don't have enough boundaries. They don't have yeah. any boundaries about access. So when you say something like to your mum, you can't come in between nine and five, that is a boundary around access. I am not accessible just because I'm in the house. I am not right. accessible to work just because I have a work phone. Just because you call me and I work for you doesn't mean you get 24-7 access to me and you get to determine that access, which also means you could say to your best friend, you get access to this information that I've got a new book deal, but a random colleague who I'm having dinner with doesn't get access to that information. Or maybe a best friend does, but a good friend doesn't. Not yet. And I'll tell the good friend in a month or I might tell the acquaintance in six months when it's a public announcement. Yeah, You get different levels of information depending on the trust that you've built with someone. But if you treat everyone like your best friend, then that's going to be a problem. But also if you block everyone out and treat everyone like a stranger or like someone who's going to be volatile or dangerous with a piece of information, even though time and time again, they've proved to you they're trustworthy, then also that's a very avoidant behavior and acting more like walls rather than boundaries. I love this. I mean, I think I just feel so equipped and so strong after this conversation. <laughs> I'm like, no one is going to disrespect me. No one is going to cross my boundaries. I but feel they will. <laughs> People cross my boundaries all the time. It's just, it's a repeated behavior that you have to keep doing. I love it. I love it. Thank you so much for this conversation. It's been so empowering. It's been so enlightening. And I'm sure everyone at home is going to be able to set their boundaries a lot better after listening to this. Oh, thanks for having me on. My pleasure. 